Hi, you are in the ladies' room with Dr. Danica, the only public ladies' room you can enter any time without ever waiting online. I'm your host, Dr. Danica Moore. We'll be having real conversations with real women about really intimate issues. They may be embarrassing, sad, or funny, but they will always be interesting and informative. You know, like the best conversations you've had in ladies' rooms with your best friends or total strangers and a physician. Please join us. Hello, and welcome to another exciting episode of In the Ladies' Room with Dr. Donica. Today, I have another physician guest. Uh, Dr. Nicole Sapphire is a board-certified radiologist with fellowship training in onco oncologic imaging. She's full-time at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and is the director of breast imaging at the regional location in Middletown, New Jersey. You may know her as a frequent medical contributor for Fox News, who has also appeared on MSNBC, HLN, Fox Business, and The Dr. Oz Show, discussing a wide variety of medical topics. But I know her from Twitter. Now, say what you want about the trolls that you may have interacted <laughs> with on Twitter, but I have met some really terrific and knowledgeable people, and I also block the trolls. Uh, Dr. Sapphire and I have both, both posted and sometimes even ranted and raved about many overlapping medical topics, but most recently was the revelation that the Trump administration tried to defeat, that means vote down, a United Nations affiliated World Health Assembly resolution, which simply called for all world governments to quote, protect, promote, and support breastfeeding unquote, which should be pretty easy to do, but it also uh, called to limit misleading marketing of formula milk. Now, this resolution was based on decades of research uh, showing that mother's milk is healthiest for babies as well as moms. Now, this story was first reported in the New York Times uh, July 8th, uh, 2018, and the Times reported that not only did the U.S. delegation attempt to defeat the resolution as if that wasn't enough, but it was embracing the interests of infant formula manufacturers over the best interests of tiny humans. In doing so, it upended the deliberations with strong-arm uh, strong tactics threatening other countries that if they didn't vote against the resolution, the United States with, uh, would withdraw aid and other support to those countries. I'm so upset about this, I can't even talk. So Dr. Sapphire and I decided it was time to talk about breastfeeding in the ladies' room. And because I don't want to end this introduction on a down note or a negative note, I do have to also point out that in other breaking breastfeeding news, I don't know if you saw this, Nicole, but swimsuit model, model? Martin yep. closed out the Sports yeah. Illustrated fashion show walking down the runway while breastfeeding her 16-month-old. Um, that was an incredible moment. That really was. So what was the most unusual thing that you ever did while breastfeeding your children, which I assume you breastfed uh, your children? Well, you know, I have three boys. I'm a mm -hmm. boy mom for sure. They mm -hmm. range from 18 down to almost four. Wow. And I breastfed all three of them, mm -hmm. each for 12 to 14 months mm -hmm. each. And you know, that was a challenge in my life, but I would say that my favorite moments are pumping while driving. Hey. Uh, and I assume you've used from work or whatever it is. I assume but, you've you know, used you the just... term favorite with quotation marks around it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, you know, when it comes to breastfeeding, you know, you and I, we know the benefits of it. And one of the reasons I'm upset about this proposed resolution or resolution or the stance that the United States is officially taking on breastfeeding is, you know, I know that breast milk is what's best for all children. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, not everyone knows that. And, you know, you do have advertisers in the world of formulas that are saying nearly equivalent to equivalent to breast milk, but there's, you know, from the breast one, there's just so much more benefit when it comes to breastfeeding. And, you know, it is disappointing to hear that, but I'll be honest, you know, the United States has had a contentious relationship with this whole idea of promoting breastfeeding for the last century. So I don't know if this is new. I just wish it wasn't current news. Right. So what we're going to try to do today is of course talk about our own experiences because if you get ever get two mothers together who've ever breastfed their children, we have tons of our own personal stories. I only breastfed two children, um, but I think my daughter breastfed for so long that it counted as a double, a double header. Um, but we're also then going to switch gears and talk about you know being doctors 
and who've read the research and read oh, the my. literature and talk about not only the benefits to the baby, but I also want to talk about the benefits to the moms. And of course, you're a breast cancer expert. Uh, so I want to start with tell everybody about the relationship between breastfeeding and breast cancer. Well, a little known fact is that breastfeeding your child actually decreases your risk of breast cancer. It, actually, it's not just breastfeeding at all. We really say greater than six months lowers your risk for breast cancer. And there are multiple reasons behind that. One being, if your breasts are so active producing milk, they're too busy doing that to form other bad things. <laughs> um, now, that's not to say breast cancer can't form when you're breastfeeding. However, it does lower your risk overall from breast cancer. It also is noted that when you are breastfeeding, a lot of the times you don't have a menstrual cycle. And the fewer menstrual cycles you have, that'll decrease your risk of breast cancer as well. And lastly, we tend to be a little bit healthier when we're breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. Most of us should be, at least. You decrease the alcohol if you don't, if not abstain mm -hmm. altogether. You eat a little bit more healthily. Maybe you're exercising more. Your metabolism's up. So just those healthy behaviors in general overall decreases your risk of cancer and, of course, breast cancer as well. Absolutely. And, and then of course outside of the breast, we know that there are positive psychological benefits to breastfeeding as well. Now, I'm not a psychiatrist or psychologist, but I do know that you do feel that bond and you do feel needed. And there are just so many positive moments that you have while breastfeeding. So physical well, because, and mental health. Because breastfeeding stimulates oxytocin production, yes. which is that what we call the feel good hormone. Um, so, you know, it was interesting that you talked about how breastfeeding is healthiest for moms. Uh, of course, President Trump tweeted, because there's a tweet for everything from him. For everything. Um, but in, in response to the backlash, that people were just horrified that, the United, that we would take this position in a United Nations World Health Assembly kind of resolution. So in response to the backlash, he tweeted, quote, the United States strongly supports breastfeeding, but we don't believe women should be denied access to formula. Many women need this option because of malnutrition and poverty, which well, is ridiculous. So I, I, I will rebuttal that slightly. I think you absolutely need breastfeeding more when you have malnutrition and poverty. And I don't, maybe he just doesn't understand that. And I wouldn't necessarily expect him to, but it is in our impoverished areas that we really need to be promoting breastfeeding because when it comes to formula feeding, and by the way, you know, Mark Twain says it best, all mm -hmm. generalizations are false. And so mm -hmm. I'm not going to say breastfeeding is right for every single mother, but we're talking majorities here. And again, I'm talking my opinions. But when you have a, a mother who's feeding formula, it's very important that they have clean water, that they Absolutely. sanitize. And by the way, formula is expensive. Mm -hmm. So in these times or what... President Trump tweeted out, that's actually where we really need to be promoting breastfeeding. Unfortunately, Absolutely. I don't think he got the memo. Yeah, so we did have a guest in one of our previous episodes in the ladies' room uh, who was from the international NGO Water Aid. And one of the things we talked about is of all of the consequences of people not having clean water. And that's, just not, that's not just in third world countries. That's also in Flint, Michigan. That's in Puerto Rico. And recently a study came out that on over a hundred- Washington, D.C. was just on with oil advisory. I mean, right. And everywhere. over a hundred military bases in the United States mm -hmm. uh, do not have acceptable clean water in many of their facilities. So, you know, that this issue of not having clean water is the biggest risk to infant health in impoverished areas. And of course, the other thing is, as we know, even when a mother is malnourished, breast milk gets the priority. So right. breast milk gets the first nutrients. In those cases, it actually may be more damaging to the mother's health. We also know that in wealthy American women who don't have adequate calcium, breast milk gets the majority of the priority for calcium and into the point where it may leach the calcium from the mother's bones, but the baby will have adequate nutritionally balanced breast milk. Now the cost of formula, I did look up and find a statistic um, that there was a report, researchers ran a cost analysis, reported that if 90% of the mothers in the United States 
breastfed exclusively for six months, it would, there'd be a savings of $13 billion per year. Wow. And that's just in our country. So yeah, formula is expensive. Um, and I'm not against formula. I actually, with my first child, I uh, was working a lot. Um, he was a little prem uh, premature and I couldn't keep up with the breast milk production. He needed to eat every two hours. So I alternated breastfeeding and formula feeding. And lots of people talk about this issue of nipple confusion. He had no nipple confusion. <laughs> he didn't care where his food was coming from so long as it kept coming. So I guess I don't get credit for exclusively having breastfed every six months with him. Although I did breastfeed every six, every four hours. So uh, maybe well, I get some extra credit. You for know, that. Women, wear, women wear breastfeeding like a badge of honor. Mm -hmm. But the reason is because it's hard. It's, it's hard. very hard. I was extremely fortunate. I had good milk production, mm -hmm. um, but I have so many friends and colleagues who don't. And you know, I can't necessarily understand that. But even for someone who was overproducing milk, I had freezers full of frozen milk. I mean, after I decided to stop breastfeeding, I still had three months supply frozen. Did you donate it? Um, no, I just kept giving it to my, my boys. <laughs> so, yeah, because there, I, are, I mean, there are breast milk yeah. banks where they accept breast, breast milk. I absolutely have seen Women that. who can't breastfeed. Um, I never did that. Um, but I think, you know, if you said you can't, did you say you can't understand when women can't produce enough or when women are producing too? No, it's not that I can't understand. It's, I, I, it, it is unfortunate and, you know, I, I sympathize with them, but I can't emphasize, emphasize with them because I don't know what that's like, but I can't imagine the, um, you know, the anxiety and the depression that may go along with a woman who isn't necessarily producing as much feelings of inadequacy and, you know, unless they have a very strong support system around them, I think that could also be a downward spiral for a woman. Well, anxiety is one of the things that can decrease your milk supply. Um, a, yes. a really basic thing that can decrease your milk supply is fatigue and sleep deprivation, which is something that women doctors know a lot about. Uh, in my case, what I found was a big part of it was mm -hmm. just simply not drinking enough water. Um, and I really needed to drink. But the bonus benefit, the reward we get for all that hard work is about five, burning about 500 extra calories per day. So did I lose you? Can you hear me? Oh, I think I lost no, you for a second. I'm still here. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, I lost you on the video. I'm here. Um, so breastfeeding burns extra calories. So anyway, I started with a question about what was the most unusual thing you ever did while breastfeeding. Um, so was there a, a I, so I bre I breastfed story? at very at, at various places during my life. I breastfed as a college student. I breastfed as a resident, and I breastfed as a fellow. Wow! And a fellow Bingo. then graduating or new attending. So um, I, I would say that you know the the challenge for me was finding places to pump, mm -hmm. and that was you know, what I found the most interesting and challenging as well, but a lot of it happened in the car. Well, my first child is 25. So my biggest challenge was finding an adequate pump. In those days, the, the handheld pumps were really your only home option. And eventually I purchased one of those industrial strength pumps, <laughs> which was humongous. And it had this big carrying case uh, and I remember at the time I was a medical director for a pharmaceutical company and I was in the elevator carrying this large thing, which came in a bright blue case. And the CEO of the company was in the elevator with me and said, oh, what's that? <laughs> and I explained what that was. But my most unusual uh, location of where I breastfed, I was actually, when I was seven weeks postpartum, I was a speaker at a, ACOG, a regional ACOG meeting in New York. And I was sitting in the back of the room and it was almost my turn to speak. So I decided to nurse him right before I talked, but I needed to hear the previous speaker so I could comment of course. on the remarks. Uh, and my nanny was literally waiting right outside the room to take him you know, as soon as I would go up and give my talk. And there were two gentlemen uh, who were also obstetricians sitting like a few rows in front of where I was. And they kept looking around, giving me the death glare. 
And one of them said very loudly to the other, I can't believe she's doing that here of all places. And you would think at an OBGYN meeting of all places, it would be okay to breastfeed. And uh, the other gentleman said, yeah, who does she think she is? And I just tapped him on the shoulder and I just politely said, I think I'm your next speaker. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and that actually did remind me of a time. So I took my boards, mm -hmm. my oral boards. I'd far past my written boards, my physics boards, but my oral boards, we had back in the day, because mm -hmm. we don't, they don't do that anymore, but we had to actually fly to Louisville wow. and do our oral boards there. And I was in the thick of breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. And so it was either take the baby and a nanny or someone, but I decided to fly in and fly out. So mm -hmm. I round tripped it for 16 hours, flying in and out of Louisville, um, breastfeeding. And so for the oral boards, it's seven hours straight from mm -hmm. one room to the next. Mm -hmm. There's no break times. There's no pumping times. Mm -hmm. And I had such limited time between my last interview and my flight. I ran straight from there to the airport. By the time I got on the airplane, I was so in uncomfortably engorged, but I sat in the airplane bathroom mm -hmm. and pumped for about 30 minutes. <laughs> Oh gosh. So I have an airplane story about breastfeeding. Um, when I was breastfeeding one of my children, I had a meeting in DC and I decided to just fly in, fly out. So I nursed, raced to the airport, and this was before 9-11. So you didn't have to worry about security lines right. or anything. I just ran right to the gate, went to the, my meeting, came back to the airport and I thought, oh great, I'm gonna make it in you know, five hours. I'm on the plane. And I was on the plane sitting on the runway for several hours while Bill Clinton had his now famous, infamous haircut on the airplane. And most people at the time did not realize, I think most media at that time focused on the fact that it was a $400 haircut. I don't care if it was a $4,000 haircut. The real issue is that when the president is in an airport, the, that airport and the two nearest airports are completely shut down for incoming or outgoing traffic. So, and we were seat belted and couldn't get up and go to the bathroom. So I just leaked all down the Ugh. front of my clothes. As I was saying, really, really very not nice things about the president. And I was sure I was gonna get a call from, you know, Secret <laughs> Service about some of the remarks I made. And because of the captain of the plane was telling us why we were sitting on the airplane. But I heard another airplane nursing story that was great from Kathy, Kathy Lee Gifford, who talks about you know, how she was in first class, she was in the window seat, she you know, had her baby and she carefully draped a blanket and she was being so discreet when the flight attendant came over and shrieked, ah, are you Kathy Lee Gifford? And is that your baby you're nursing? And Kathy Lee said, no, we're doing a special promotion. I'm nursing all the babies on the plane today. <laughs> That's great. I, yeah, I mean, that. I had some not so nice, you know, encounters mm -hmm. of, with breastfeeding. One occurred on the plane. I was also in first class on the window because if you're traveling with a breastfeeding infant, <laughs> that's kind of the best place to be if you're able to be there because you mm -hmm. can hide um, and you have the space. And so I was the same way. I was very quietly draped. And the bait, my son, they were amazing little boys. And mm -hmm. so I was feeding him quietly mm -hmm. and his foot, little foot rested on the, the central armrest. Mm -hmm. And the gentleman left next to me said, I hope you don't plan on thinking that's your armrest the entire thing. We are sharing that. I would appreciate <laughs> if you move his foot. I'm like, Which is pretty amazing okay. because- Every man I have ever sat with on an airplane ever in all my years of being a frequent flyer, every man has always assumed that that armrest is theirs. And, you know, yes. he's doing manspanding. Unbelievable. So how did you respond? That's symbolic of greater things in this world, by the way. <laughs> how did you respond? Um, I pressed the little ding dong and the um, air flight attendant came to me and I said, I recommend either you move me or you moved him or like wow. I have an altercation at some point during this flight. I didn't even acknowledge his existence. And was she able to and move you? And that's what happened. And, 
And interestingly, a gentleman who was oh, I'm losing saw you this whole thing, uh -huh. and he actually said, I will gladly switch with her. He's, a gentleman across the way said, I will gladly switch with her and sit next to this gentleman so that he, I can put my arm on that armrest and he can now have a problem with me. <laughs> I, I remember sticking up for me. The first time I flew <laughs> uh, with uh, also in first class, and I don't fly first class that often, but um, I, the first time I flew in first class with two babies, everyone else in the cabin gave me the death glare. They were just like, they all were like Ugh. that somebody could bring these two vermin into first class. <laughs> and the kids were fabulous. They didn't make a peep. And as the men were getting, they were all, uh, they were all men. And as they were getting off the plane at the end, it was each one almost felt like they had to apologize to me that you know, the kids were so well behaved and they knew that they had reacted horribly about having the babies. But lest we leave on a bad note, I also had an experience on a plane once where I was with the two kids by myself and they were like, my kids are only 16 months apart. So I had like a newborn and a toddler and uh, a gentleman across the way said to me, if you need any help or if you need to go to the restroom by yourself, I'm certified as the father of three and I would be happy to you know, <laughs> help you in any way. And that was the only time wow. in 18 years traveling with children that anyone ever offered to help me. So I thought that was wonderful. So anyway, back wow. to breastfeeding. So what advice would you give women who are having difficulty first making the decision about whether or not to breastfeed. And of course, this is a completely no judgment zone. Right, of course, this, this is just my opinion. Oh, I wait. wish that it wasn't necessarily, you have to make a decision to breastfeed. I necessarily, you have to make a decision to breastfeed. I truly wish that the intention is always or mm -hmm. that you're going to breastfeed. And if you can't breastfeed, then you consider formula. But I, you know, the initial decision really should just not be a decision. It should be breastfeeding. That's, you know, that is what is best for you, what's best for your children. However, you know, there are a lot of variables in everyone's life that make it whether you can't produce milk, whether your lifestyle just is not amenable to it. And that can be for multiple reasons. You know, that I don't want to make anyone feel bad or give anybody, you know, a, a bad presence if they're saying, well, I work, I can't breastfeed. I live this lifestyle, I can't breastfeed. I mean, who am I to judge? I just well, want- Well, let's talk about the number, let's talk about the number one. Support. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I'm, I'm losing it in and out and I was just trying to jump in. Um, let's talk about the number one reason women can't breastfeed and that's having had previous breast surgeries. And I think one of the biggest question marks are for women who have breast implants and also for women of reduction. So you wanna to speak to that? Sure, anytime you alter a breast anatomy, uh, you're changing the lobules, you're changing the ducts, that is essentially you're altering um, how the ducts communicate with the nipple and therefore you potentially could be decreasing milk production and delivery through the nipple. Um, a lot of times now implants are being placed behind the muscle, so this is not altering the anatomy nearly as much. However, a lot of women are still having reduction um, mastopexies, which really, if, as, a, as a breast imager, when you see that on a mammogram, it is, it is crazy on the inside what happens. I mean, it, look, it has a great cosmetic outcome by um, reducing the size of the breast and making them maybe a little bit more perky. But on the inside, they're essentially taking a pie wedge out and then pulling it all back together and pinning it in. So it's really disrupting a lot of the anatomy of the breast, which could potentially cause future problems of breastfeeding. Yeah, we had a great episode where we talked about a woman, uh, we talked with a woman who had had a breast reduction when she was a teenager. Uh, and we actually called it tweaking the teens. Because it turns out breast reduction surgery in teenagers is actually one of the fastest growing cosmetic surgeries in teenagers, not just in girls, but also in boys. And this is in large part due to our obesity epidemic uh, and also our bullying epidemic. Yes. Um, what other barriers are there to breastfeeding? Um, you know, certainly there are women now who are having children after having had cancer. So certainly, of course, having had a mastectomy, 
Uh, but then there are many women who are getting treatment for other medical illnesses, so they may be on medications. Uh, any other of those? Well, you have physical, mental, me physical and mental barriers to breastfeeding. Um, you've mentioned some of them. Obviously, having a mastectomy, you're not, you know, have no longer have breast tissue, so you will not be able to breastfeed. Mm -hmm. um, but also having any sort of illness, a lot of medications can decrease milk production. Sometimes when you are breastfeeding, I'm sure you know, your nipples can actually get really raw and it's painful and they can bleed yes. or they can get infected or anything. And all of a sudden you don't necessarily want to breastfeed anymore, but the answer is you really should keep going because it will get better. So those are a lot of the physical barriers to it. Um, not to mention women who go back to work right away mm -hmm. or who are out in public or are around a lot of people. Maybe they don't feel comfortable doing it in public. Um, they don't feel comfortable pumping at their workplace. Mm -hmm. um, then also um, emotionally, it, it, it's very difficult for anyone to have a baby. It's not all rainbows and unicorns. Yeah. We have babies. Mm -hmm. You know, you are sleep deprived. You are going through a tremendous amount of emotions because your hormones are changing. Um, anxious, anxiety, depression, all of these different um, feelings can really hinder a woman's ability to breastfeed. And it, it's, I can be honest, it's difficult to overcome them if you don't have that support system. If you're not committed to really wanting to do this, it's really easy to just say, I can't do this anymore. Well, and I think one of the issues is that we are so obsessed with privacy in breastfeeding where, you know, I know I did this and most of my friends did this, where we nursed in the bathrooms. You know, so what, a be what better topic for in the ladies' room uh, to discuss? <laughs> uh, I actually had a woman, I was, I was breastfeeding once in a department store ladies' room, which they're usually very nice with, you know, the couches, you know, before the toilet area. And I was just sitting there minding my own, feet, uh, minding my own business breastfeeding. And this woman said, I can't believe you're doing that here. And I said, well, where should I exactly be doing this? <laughs> if you can think of a better place, I'm eager to hear it. But I think what this model did, of course, was so striking, uh, Mara Martin in the Sports Illustrated show, that she marched down the runway while nursing the baby. I think most people have not seen a woman bare-breastedly nursing a baby in public. Now, of course, what I also think was a very surprising thing that she did is she was in the Sports Illustrated uh, swimsuit fashion show being a very muscular, very fit, not skinny model. Uh, so I think that was also a big barrier breaker for a lot of people. And they had her finish out the show. Right. And, you know, we're in a, it's a different era. People are proud of their bodies. I mean, we're, I mean, we have the Kardashians, so it's American royalty right now, and they have really emphasized being voluptuous. And I think it has changed people's idea of what the perfect body is. When it comes to breastfeeding, I'm definitely in the middle. I'm, the pendulum didn't go too far either way for me. Um, I, w I did breastfeed in public, but I never bared all. I was always very covered up. Um, and I really, you know, I would try and arrange things so that I didn't have to necessarily breastfeed in public. Um, but on the same token, if I saw a woman bare breasted breastfeeding, I wasn't offended by it. Mm -hmm. um, just wasn't something I was comfortable with. Yeah. It's very interesting, too, how social media has until very recently been screening out photos of women breastfeeding as pornography. And on the Not same sure. token, they, yeah, as I was gonna say, they don't allow women who's had, who've had mastectomy and reconstruction to discuss surgical scars and stuff. They won't post that. They, all those photos get taken down as inappropriate. And right, which is just amazing. And I don't know how all the porn sites get away with all of this, uh, being able to post all their stuff, but God forbid you're, you're breastfeeding. I actually thought I, I was so proud of myself once uh, when my first child was a baby. Uh, I was at a meeting, speaking of this, the, the rainstorm today, I was at a meeting in D.C. when there was a terrible snowstorm. And D.C. shuts down when a quarter of an inch of snow is predicted, let alone when it actually falls. And I was relying on a hotel babysitter who was a no-show. And this was the Society for Women's Health Research meeting. I was chairing the meeting. My son was a baby. And my then husband, the baby's father, was also a speaker at the same meeting. And so I had no recourse. And I said, you know what? You know, women farmers have been farming while they 
carried their babies on their backs. And I just held my son in, in my arms and he was about three or four months old. And I shared the meeting and I made some pithy remarks about how one of the biggest barriers to women's health research was adequate childcare for women researchers. And then I did my talk, sat down, nursed the baby and back up again. But yeah, I also didn't bare breast it. <laughs> Yeah. It was very, well, very discreet. Uh, you know, I'm going to give kudos to my um, society, the American College of Radiology. Just this last year in May at our um, national meeting, one of the new highlights was child care. Child care during the entire program, even during the social events, mm -hmm. to really encourage women, especially, to come out, even if you need to bring your kids, they're taken care of. And, you know, kudos to them. Well, the American College of OBGYNs had child care for years and years, even when my children were little, but I think they had to be a certain age. Uh, there was also a limit on how many kids they could accept. So if you weren't registered yeah. in the first two weeks. But my issue with ACOG was they used to hold their meetings every year on Mother's Day. Uh, also, usually my birthday. So it's a national holiday. And so I complained one year and I said, you know, how did this come to be that Mother's Day was always when you had the ACOG meeting? And the executive director said to me, directly to me, that, well, we always assumed that the men would enjoy bringing their wives to the meetings. Hmm. I said, okay, and we now have women OBGYNs too, mm -hmm. who you're separating from their children or from our mothers. You know, yeah. So then they decided to alternate it. Um, well, that's good. They explained to me they booked the meetings like five years in advance. So let's talk about, uh, just to wrap up, we kind of glossed over the assumption, because uh, we assume this, that everybody knows what the be benefits of breastfeeding are to babies. So aside from the fact that it's perfectly composed nutrition, what are the other health benefits uh, of breastfeeding to babies? Well, the immunologic benefits as well. I mean, we know babies don't don't have the best immune system when they're first born until they're vaccinated, having breast milk actually keeps them somewhat protected from some of the illnesses. So you need to expand on just the saying that it's nutritious because yes, the formula companies do go around saying we're just as nutritious and we have the vitamins, but there's just, there's more to it. Not only does it have nutrition benefits, the immunologic benefits to decrease. It also decreases um, the chance of having chronic illnesses in the future. I mean, there've been so many studies that show this, you know, decreases risk of SIDS. It decreases ear infections. It can decrease respiratory infections. It can decrease long-term obesity. And I'm sure anything else you can find one study that it says breastfeeding decreases the risk of this. Yeah, my, my biggest motivator was the decrease in ear infections because as every mother knows, like ear infections are such a horrible nuisance. And fortunately, in most cases, it's not a severe illness, but it keeps you both from sleeping. It keeps the whole family from sleeping. Uh, and there's to go to work the next morning. I mean, about it um, in the middle of the night, um, other than Oralgin, which I thought was the best drug ever. These are just eardrops mm -hmm. that desensitize the ear till yes. you get to the <laughs> pediatrician. Uh, my son actually said to me when he was about 12 years old, uh, just randomly, he said, mommy, when I have, grow up and have children, are you still going to be able to write prescriptions? And I said, yes. And he just vis you know, had this visible sigh of relief. And he said, oh, good, because I can't imagine how difficult it would be to be a parent if you had to actually go to a doctor every time your child was sick. I know. <laughs> so I thought that was really great. But, but in terms of convenience, that's another huge selling point of breastfeeding as far as I'm concerned, is it's oh, so much absolutely. easier Oh, absolutely. Formula. You don't have so, to go to the store and buy anything. You don't have the dirty bottles. You don't have to lug them all around. You don't have to worry about sanitizing them. I mean, one of the problems is actually mixing formula. A lot of people actually do it wrong. They don't get the right formula to water ratio. So maybe it's, it's too concentrated for the baby, and that can have negative health effects on the child. And especially if they're really not sanitizing, you can't just wash a bottle like you're washing your wine glass. It's not the same thing. And so if you're not thoroughly cleaning these and then you just feed them to the baby, not only are you not getting the health benefits of the formula or the breast milk, but now you're actually making your child sick. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and of course, if the heard. breast is infected, even if the breast is infected, you can still feel the feed the baby and it's still the best thing for the baby. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think we've covered a tremendous amount of territory. Is there anything else that you wanted to say about this? You know, I, I'm, I have to say something on the other side a little bit because I just read an article that was talking about a woman, a young girl. That's one of the issues is when you're not educated. Is a young, she was in your young 20s. Uh, she had a baby and she is re- now being charged with killing her baby because she was doing drugs and the baby ended up overdosing via the breast milk. Oh my God. So of course, breast milk isn't always the best if the mother is not healthy. And so it is crucial to know if you are not taking the right precautions, being healthy yourself, you know, what's coming out of your body might not be the healthiest for your child as well. So, you know, that, what I, you know, I want to say to everyone, breastfeed, breastfeed, breastfeed. Of course, I would like this woman not to be doing drugs, but if she's going to be, if you're going to be doing drugs, then at that point, there needs to be a discussion of what is truly the best thing for the baby. And that has to, and that's true with prescription drugs also. There are many prescription medications that you can't breastfeed uh, while you're taking prescription medications. You have to take that seriously. I mean, it's, this, is, this is also a great reminder that nobody should do heroin. It's uh, so never a good idea. We often forget that. Um, one of my other pet peeves is I'm, I'm no longer saying heroin overdose. Uh, somebody pointed out, a, a woman who's a good friend of mine whose son died of a heroin overdose said to me, it implies that there's a safe dose of heroin. There's no safe dose right. of heroin. So it's just a kind of heroin, heroin usage. Yes. Um, and that's a whole nother topic uh, that we have to discuss. But absolutely, there's certain drugs that you, you can't breastfeed, whether they're legal or not. And that you know is, is critically important. Uh, yes. So as with anything, it kind of reminds me that obviously you and I are doctors, but we're just talking to each other for everybody who's listening, you know, we hope you gain some insight from this topic. We hope you gain some funny stories from this topic. But obviously, every person has to get their own medical advice from their own physician. Well, and I'll tell you, I'm proud. My mother calls my breast beaver tails, and I'm proud of my beaver tails these days. <laughs> Flapjacks, I prefer to call them. But, you know, it is what it is. And I'm glad that I was able to do it. And I truly hope that, you know, the way for most people is to breastfeed because I think it is just one of the best things you can do for yourself and your child. Absolutely. And I didn't love it. I didn't wax euphoric about how it was the best thing ever. Uh, But I did feel like I was giving my children the healthiest start in life. I I truly think med school, residency, internship, fellowship aside, breastfeeding is one of the hardest things I've ever done. And it didn't get easier any of the times. But you did it at the same time. (laughs) Right, that's true. <laughs> I probably had an easier time waiting till all that was done and then breastfeeding. Possibly, uh, yes. But ideally, you breastfeed when you have a baby. So, <laughs> and actually, there are women who adopt children who go to great lengths to s- simulate yeah. breastfeeding and to simulate those uh, kinds of bonding activities. Uh, so I think all of that is great. And then, of course, what I always say on any topic related to having a child is everything we say are recommendations based on the ideal scenario. The goal is a healthy mother and a healthy child and how you get there, whether it's by breastfeeding or formula feeding, or in my case, a combination of the two. Um, However you get there is fine so long as you get there. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. So thank you so much for joining us today in the ladies' room. I'm sorry for the weather difficulties and the technical (laughs) difficulties uh, and the difficult topic. Uh, but I think we got a lot of really useful information and I'm going to invite everybody to send us any questions that they have to ask Dr. Donica at gmail.com. Of course, I take questions from Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and any questions that are addressed to you, I will send to you and hope that you will, uh, respond, uh, because our listeners have lots of questions. So Sounds great. I'm also on Twitter, so feel free to ask. And that's where I found you. (laughs) (laughs) So where can people find you on Twitter? Uh, N-B-S-A-P-H-I-E-R-M-D at gmail. No, not. That's your email. I've now combined them. N-B Sapphire M-D. That's it. Got it. Okay. We will see you on Twitter. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of the storm. Thank you. Take care. That's all we have time for today. But let's keep the conversation going on Twitter or Facebook at Dr. Dunica.
And please join us next week for another episode of In the Ladies' Room with Dr. Danica. Real conversations with real women about really intimate topics.